was the technology that Dr. Carrico developed. And then that recipe goes into a human cell. It doesn't go into the human nucleus, so it's not getting integrated into the human genetic information. This is our mRNA. It's out here in the cell, but it tells the cell to make spike protein. So the cell goes, oh, okay, here comes this recipe. I'm going to make spike protein. This is the, your human cell. And the spike protein then goes out into the, into the body. And when that happens, then other cells, the T cells and B cells come along and they go, ooh, that's something foreign. I don't like that. I'm going to make an antibody, a neutralizing antibody. So they make the antibody. And then that antibody goes out and it attaches to the spike protein and neutralizes it. And that's what an mRNA vaccine does. So when the, another, when the real, real virus comes along, you've been vaccinated with an mRNA vaccine, when the real, de real deal comes along, your body's going to go, oh, I know this thing because I made antibodies to it. So it's going to stimulate your T cells and B cells to make antibodies. And those go out and they attach to the virus and whammo, they kill the virus. And that's how an mRNA vaccine works. So none of this material goes into your genetics. It doesn't harm you. This is a very inert, harmless piece of material. It's just the recipe for the spike protein. And that's why they're so safe. And the other piece of this is, is they're really easy to make quickly and make a lot of them. The, the technology is very easy to do. So the advantage of, it, of mRNA vaccines over conventional vaccines is they're very safe. There's no risk of infection or cancer mutagenesis of inserting genetic, uh, viral genetic material. They can be degraded by normal cellular process. Your, your, your kind of policemen and vacuum cleaners in your immune system can go along and tidy things up after they've been injected. You can fine tune them. In other words, you can make these vaccines more immunogenic, in other words, more robust immune response, and you can also change the recipe if you need to. And now you may be hearing about some of these nasty viruses in England and in South Africa, one of which is probably here in the United States already. The, this technology allows you to change the vaccine should you need to. And I will tell you that as of today, Pfizer has um, done a study with the University of Texas that shows that the vaccine they're using right now will um, be effective for the B1117 variant that comes from, it's in England uh, and the one in South Africa. But if it wasn't, or if the virus mutates down the road, which viruses do, you can change it's the about uh, And then there's, so there's, they, they, then also they're easy to make, they're rapid, they're inexpensive, and, and you can make a bunch of them. Now, once, we'll say that one thing that the previous administration has done well is that and this was actually not the Trump administration that did this, it was the pharmaceutical companies, they thought we're in dire straits, we better be ready to go once the trials are finished and we can see that the vaccines work. They had a pretty good hunch the vaccines were gonna work. And so they started making lots of virus uh, before it was actually shown to work, excuse me, lots of virus, lots of vaccine before it was shown to work. And so uh, once it was approved, we had lots of doses to go ahead and start doing it, but you can continue to make high volumes of, of vaccine very cheaply. The disadvantages of mRNA vaccines, they haven't been studied in a pandemic, but here we go. Uh, there might be some things down the road that we didn't see or didn't predict. I don't think that's really going to be an issue because these vaccines are not dangerous. It's not dangerous material that you're putting into anybody. Um, they haven't been well tested in, you know, in human beings. When you go from a study of 30,000 people to a study of 300 million people or, or 30 billion people, then you start seeing some things that maybe you didn't see before, but we don't, we don't know that. We know that some of the previous attempts have not been, have been, have failed. Uh, and we don't know, and this is perhaps the more important thing right now, is we don't know how long this immunity lasts, but I will comment on that in a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just focus on Pfizer, but the same applies to the Moderna vaccine. They're really almost identical. Um, I just got my second dose of Pfizer vaccine yesterday and I have a sore arm, uh, but um, I'll, I'll present the data here for you. So they had about 43,000 people who enrolled. They ended up using about 37,000 people. Half of them received the vaccine, half of them received placebo. Uh, they were from about 16 to 55 years old, not a really wide range of age. It's hard to do studies on old, very old people or very young people or people who have other comorbidities like immune compromise or they're pregnant or something. It's pretty equally divided among men and women. And they had a pretty, pretty decent um, diversity in, in ethnicity. And just to sort of cut to the chase, this is the, what, what was, so star, was so startling. You'll hear Dr. Fauci, he was saying that they would hope for a vaccine that was about 60 to 70% effective. That would be a good thing. That's what a, a flu vaccine achieves. These vaccines turned out to be 95% effective. And you can see these are the people that received the placebo during the course of the uh, study. 
And these are the people that got COVID. You can see the number of cases of COVID just increased, increased, increased. These are the people that got the real vaccine, very few cases. They did have four cases of COVID, but there was very mild disease. So that showed that this vaccine was 94.5% effective. Uh, and if you did happen to get COVID, it was a much diminished uh, case. You didn't have to be hospitalized, you didn't die, you didn't get very sick. So that was truly astounding. Um, this is the antibody response. This is the real data. I'll show you my little graphic of it because maybe it's a little bit easier to understand. And you can see here's the first vaccine. You give that at day one. And then for both of these vaccines, these are two part vaccines. You have a prime dose and then what we call a boost dose. And the idea for that is to enhance the immune response. So at day, day one, you get your vaccine. By the eighth day after your vaccine, you already are beginning to develop some neutralizing antibodies, pretty good amounts, 40 to 60%. So if you happen to encounter COVID during this time between vaccinations, you still may have quite a bit of protection. Just before you receive your second vaccine, three weeks later, you, you've got pretty good amounts of, of virus now, 65 to 80%. And that's why you may hear some of the uh, governments, including the, uh, ours, talk about just getting as many people vaccinated with the first dose as possible but the second dose does really improve things. And so when you get the booster dose, it brings those neutralizing antibodies way up and that protects you quite well. And it may be that second dose that protects you for a longer period of time. We don't know how long these vaccines are gonna be effective. We think it, at least a few years, maybe for life, we, we don't know. But you can see that you also get better uh, immune responses with the vaccine than you do with having COVID. And that's why right now we recommend that even if you've had COVID, that you still get vaccinated. We recommend that you do that 90 days after you've uh, recovered from COVID, but you still get vaccinated because you need to have that long-term uh, immune response that the vaccines can deliver. And this just is the data showing the cellular immune response. And you know, in addition to the antibodies, we have a cell response. And you can see that the, that the um, uh, Pfizer vaccine caused a stimulation of T and B cells, which will allow for that memory. So what are the side effects? I can tell you after my first shot, I had a pretty sore arm. Um, uh, yesterday I had my second shot and I had a really sore arm. And then last night I had felt kind of had a little bit of sort of flu like stuff with kind of crawly skin and maybe a little bit of chills. I didn't have a fever. Some of my colleagues have had fevers. Some people get a little sicker, especially people that have probably had exposure to COVID. Maybe they didn't get COVID, but for example, they work in the emergency department or they're testing a lot of people. So they may have these little micro doses of, of coronavirus. And then when they get vaccinated, the immune system goes, oh, I know what that is. And it has a little more uh, dramatic response. But for the most part, the side effects were really pretty minimal. Uh, fatigue, headache, maybe a little bit of chills, maybe some diarrhea, maybe a fever. Most of that seemed to occur after the second vaccine because that's your immune system responding to that uh, spike protein that's coming in with the vaccine. Uh, but nothing terrible. Nobody developed paralysis um, uh, or anything like that. There were a couple cases of Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy is a paralysis of the facial nerve, which is very common in the general public. There were four cases in the Pfizer group and three in the Moderna group. Um, but those resolved without any problems. Those are benign things usually. And so that was kind of maybe the worst thing. There was no really terrible side effect. So now we have to get down to who's going to get vaccinated. And um, this is changing rapidly as the administration will change. Um, what we've done is when the vaccine's been rolled out now, the first uh, tier is what we call them. We have a tiering system. And we have this at the hospital. Dr. Shindy knows about it, uh, where you um, figure out, you assess people's risk. So even within our hospital, we wanted people that were right on the front lines to be the first people to be vaccinated um, because they're really exposed to the virus. I'm an infectious disease doctor. I do get exposed to the virus regularly. I probably don't nearly get the exposure that the nurses in the COVID units or the emergency room do. Um, but I think I had to be the first patient because I think everybody thought, well, if Shriner gets it, maybe I'll get it. And I can assure you that I still have an arm, it still works, and I haven't grown another nose. So, um, so far, so good. Uh, after healthcare workers, the federal government, is, uh, and they've already started this, they want to um, go to very vulnerable populations. The people in nursing homes uh, have been really hit hard, and so they're getting vaccinated right now, as are their caregivers. We're going to move into first responders, uh, paramedics, EMT, police, fire, urgent care places, hospice, dialysis. Then the elderly, elderly in this group is greater than 75. That's gonna happen pretty soon, probably in the next couple of weeks. I'll talk a little bit about how you can get a vaccine. And then moving into teachers and college students and then everybody else. So we hope that under an organized and well thought out and scientifically driven program in the Biden administration, 
that we are going to have vaccines for everybody who wants them at least by April or maybe even sooner, but certainly by April and May. And once that starts happening, when you get enough people vaccinated or you have enough people who've had the disease, then you begin to achieve what we call herd immunity, where the herd, that's us humans, becomes, um, there's no place for the virus to go. And so it just jumps from John to Mary, but they've both had COVID or Mary got vaccinated. So the virus has nowhere to go and, and it goes and disappears. Are we still gonna have coronavirus problems for the next couple of years? I think so. Now the first SARS just kind of poof, disappeared. So it's possible that this one would do that, but I think it's gonna be, we're gonna have little outbreaks here and there, but hopefully pray, please pray that this is the last really, really big surge that we have because it's really awful. So that's sort of the light at the end of the tunnel. I get a lot of questions about pregnant women or people who are breastfeeding. They weren't part of the study, although nine women did get pregnant in the Pfizer study and nothing happened. They had perfectly normal uh, pregnancies and, and babies. The American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends that these vaccines should not be withheld from pregnant women, especially women that might be doing high risk things like working in an ICU or an emergency room, that they should be vaccinated. There's nothing about this technology that should be um, detrimental to the, to the fetus. Immunocompromised people absolutely should be um, vaccinated. We, again, this is a safe vaccine. There's nothing live about it's a killed vaccine. And, and we know that immunocompromised people, cancer patients, um, not so much HIV patients, but cancer patients, uh, people with bad diabetes and cardiovascular disease, they're very high risk for a bad outcome with this disease. Children, there's a study, Pfizer's extending now and doing a, a study in kids about ages eight to 12. It's very hard to do studies in really little kids. We do know that little kids get COVID. Some of them get this terrible inflammatory syndrome, which can kill them. Uh, but in general, children don't get as sick with COVID and their immune systems are a little different. So we're gonna have to watch how we use the vaccine with them. But we also know they can spread the disease. So they do need to be vaccinated probably. People that have underlying neurologic disorders, that's a little bit questionable right now. Things like multiple sclerosis or ALS or Guillain-Barre, probably these vaccines would be safe. I think very most likely they would be safe, but we don't know. So we wanna maybe step lightly on that one. And we have maybe heard about a few people who've had anaphylaxis to the vaccines. Uh, anybody who has anaphylaxis to medications where they have a really severe reaction, we wanna watch them very carefully after they've been vaccinated. I'm not gonna spend too much time on the IRB because those are that's how things are done. Um, you know, the, the issue with COVID though is we need to get our country vaccinated. We need to get the world vaccinated. And so the problem with the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines is although they are very effective is they're very delicate vaccines. And that's why they have to be kept at very, very low temperatures. The Pfizer vaccine in particular that has to be kept at minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's why it's been principally used only in hospitals because uh, hospitals that have the freezer capacity to do that. The Moderna vaccine has to be frozen, but it doesn't have to be quite as cold as that, but it still has to be frozen. So these vaccines may not be very helpful in countries where there's no electricity or where refrigeration is a real problem. And that's where the traditional vaccine platforms like the AstraZeneca vaccine or the CanSino and uh, Sinopharm, the Chinese vaccines, or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which only require minimal amounts of refrigeration. Those may be the vaccines we use in those countries. Uh, but we've got to get the whole planet vaccinated to get rid of this thing. And that's a Herculean task. Um, there has to be equity. Um, you know, everybody should have access to this. Uh, there shouldn't be any preference to people because of their wealth or their ethnicity or their, uh, their religion or their gender. Um, you know, it really has to be, all this virus wants to do is infect human beings. And so uh, it has to be fair and we have to have access for everybody around the planet. It is the responsibility of wealthy countries like ours and those in Europe and China to help uh, facilitate vaccinations in countries that can't afford it because that's how we're going to end the pandemic. So I am happy to take some questions now. I hope that wasn't too long. I will stop sharing that. And um, Waleed, I don't know how you want to open it up to questions or- Yeah, so let's, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Dr. Schreiner, for a very enlightening uh, and very thorough uh, discussion about the vaccine. Uh, I learned something today. So the way I'd like to do it, if we can, um, if you could raise your hand uh, or put it in the chat box. No, not like that, Nasser. Raise your hand via Zoom. Uh, there's a there's a task that, that uh, Ibat just did it there on, on the zoom there's a way to raise your hand or put it in the chat box and then I'll just call on you one by one so we don't inundate Dr. Schreiner with a lot of questions at once um, so I'm going to ask on Ibat, Ibat go ahead 
first, I want to thank you very much. That was very enlightening, and you answered a lot of my questions before I even asked them. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts first about the idea of delaying the second dose that's emerging at least uh, in the UK. So uh, the reason that the Brits decided to do that and, and Biden, of course, he's not, I don't think that uh, he wants to delay the second dose. He just wants to kind of get everything that we've got out there right now and get it as many people vaccinated. Um, the, Brit the British have done it because they're having, you know, they're having a terrible pandemic and they and there's quite a, a lot of evidence that you get some pretty good immunity after that first <laughs> dose it may come in the next you know year or two and studying this thing that we don't need to give the second dose however the studies for these this type of vaccine and also the AstraZeneca vaccine which is a more traditional platform shows that you get much much better neutral um, neutralizing antibodies and a probably a longer immunity by giving that booster dose and, you know, we do give boosters. We give boosters. We do the rabies vaccine, which I've had because I go to Africa. That's a three-part vaccine. Uh, hepatitis B, uh, we give a booster. Uh, we give a booster for tetanus. So we know the vaccine, some vaccines, measles, it lasts for life. We hope this one could be a lifelong one. But the uh, second dose really helps the, it kind of establish uh, the memory that's needed for the immune system to be able to fight off the virus should you encounter it. So that's that's the thought. Um, I have some concerns about delaying the, the second dose. It, you, you have a little flexibility. You can do it a few days here and there on either side of that three week or four week period. You might be able to do it six or eight weeks later and get some, a good response. Uh, I certainly understand the urgency to trying to get everybody vaccinated as quickly as possible to kind of get this thing under control. Um, and so we've had a pretty slow rollout here in the United States. And I think that's what what Biden wants to do is to get, try to speed things up, but still give that second dose if we can. If for some reason you miss the second dose, it's not a catastrophe, you do have some immunity, uh, but we want to try to do this as it was studied. And my second question is, um, well, in our hospital, there are both the Moderna and the Pfizer, and by the time I got to getting my first dose, it was the Moderna. Do you think the Moderna will also be effective uh, against the new variant of the UK? Yeah, the Moderna actually might even be a little more um, broad. It has a, they, the, the, you know, the, there's very little difference between the two of them. There's obviously enough that they have different patents. So, um, but the Moderna has a little tiny bit more goodies in it than the, than the Pfizer, and that might m make it a little more flexible with some of the variations. You know, viruses normally mutate, and that's a pretty normal thing. Sometimes they mutate into when get developed mutations that, that kill the virus. That's a pretty normal thing as well. Um, there are a couple of things we do worry about. There's a strain, where was it? It wasn't in South Africa, someplace that, that looked a little nastier um, that we're going to have to keep an eye on. But again, if we develop a mutation that, that renders the current vaccines uh, problematic, then we can tweak that mRNA a little bit and use that as a booster probably. But Moderna is absolutely equivalent. And what's really surprising is the, the efficacy rate of both of them. I mean, they both were 95%. I mean, that nobody was expecting that. I think that Dr. Fauci knew that. That's why he was sort of optimistic in spite of this horrible wave of COVID that was heading towards us. Um, and I think that um, he also let slip a few weeks ago that he thought that maybe this vaccine would be good for life. So uh, he may have some data on that. Um, but it appears that both of them are quite effective for uh, the variants that we know are around. Thank you. Uh, Erica, you have a question for Dr. Schreiner? Yeah, yeah I first want to say thank you so much, Dr. Schreiner. This was very informative. Um, I'm just wondering for the people where it takes them a long time to recover uh, from COVID, I mean, do you have to wait till you're completely healthy and completely recovered to start the 90 days or? Yeah, we, we want you to because um, uh, if you're not feeling well, we don't want, you know, we don't want people to give, we don't want to give the vaccine to people that aren't feeling well. Now we have given the vaccine to people who are in the very early stages of COVID and then they get kind of sick, you know, after the vaccine. The reason for not for waiting 90 days is we want you to you want the vaccine to stimulate your immune system and after you've had the disease remember you do have neutralizing antibodies you have some immunity and if you do it too close to the the symptoms of the disease then the vaccine's um, sort of potency begins to is affected a little bit that's sort of the idea anyway 
Now that being said, there's probably lots of people out in the world that didn't even know they had COVID and they may have had COVID last week and they trot down there and they get their vaccine. Some interesting things we're seeing in the hospital is that, as I mentioned, uh, some of my colleagues that have had COVID, when they got the vaccine, they, they were pretty sick with the vaccine. I mean, they had a high fever and stuff because their body already knew COVID. And so they got the vaccine like, oh man, that's, we, that's bad stuff. And so they, they got pretty sick, but they, they recovered, it was fine. So that's why we want you to wait at least three months from uh, the symptomatology. But you, you're, during that time period, mm -hmm. if, if you've had COVID, you're protected because um, uh, you have antibodies that your body has made already. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, next up is Nasser. Um, okay, so I, I, everyone wants to thank you, so I'll do the same. <clears throat> thank you, Tarek, uh, for providing the link uh, that, uh, to the cow thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, so my question is just to understand, uh, two-part question. The first one is the difference between the first uh, vaccine and the second. Is it the same thing twice or yes? It's the same. It's the same dose. Yeah, you may have read about the AstraZeneca vaccine. That's a different vaccine. That's an adenovirus vaccine. And they kind of goofed. Um, they had a study set, I think it was in Brazil, and they were giving half the vaccine, the first for the prime, and then a full dose for the boost. And they, they were, AstraZeneca was a little embarrassed about that, but then they looked at the data and that actually seemed to be better than giving the full dose both times. Uh, however, my understanding is they have returned to giving the full dose both times for that vaccine. But for this, these two vaccines, you're given the same dose both times. I see. And, and then the second question to uh, copy my cousin, uh, Iba. Um, is the, uh, I learned that they use nanoparticles when uh, within the vaccine. And I've also read that some of the nanoparticles have some uh, negative effects, especially if it's like aluminum or something like that, that affects memory. And so could you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, I don't know. Uh, these vaccines basically are sort of the, the adjuvant agent, which is the transport medium. Um, and just the, the, the package that the little information goes into, and then this little piece of mRNA. I don't think that these vaccines have a lot of other types of potentially toxic or harmful um, substances. There is a nanoparticle vaccine, the Novavax vaccine, that's a subunit vaccine. And to, I think to maintain the stability of those, nanopartic of those um, subunits, the nanoparticles are used in that. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, um, I don't think that there's a lot of really danger with these vaccines, any of these vaccines, in terms of causing long-term side effects. I know people are, are skittish about vaccines, um, but the truth is vaccines are really very safe. We vaccinate people all the time, and we don't see a lot of problems. Uh, and these two vaccines, I don't think, have a lot of, it's a pretty simple recipe. So I don't think I would be too worried about a sort of small amounts of, of other kinds of substances. You know, a lot of people were worried about thimerosal, which is a med, an, an adjuvant that's used, some, was used, not anymore, but was used and sort of has some remote chemical characteristics of mercury. And there was a lot of flapping around about that, that that was causing problems. But these vaccines are pretty pure and uh, they're very good at stimulating the immune system and they don't seem to have anything, any kind of impurities that would cause a long-term problem. So they're not using nanoparticle to carry the vaccine? No, the, these are, it's just a little lipid envelope. I don't believe for the mRNA vaccines, there's any kind of nanoparticles. Now, nanoantibodies, which you might've read about, um, which are the kind of antibodies that llamas make, which are you know, in the camel family. That's a really interesting thing. And you can, we can talk about that some other time, but that, that may be another part of vaccine development where we could develop, a, for example, a flu vaccine that would you take it once in your life and you wouldn't have to get revaccinated. So, I think this pandemic is going to um, stimulate a lot of new research in vaccines, which will in the long run will really, really help people when it comes to infectious diseases, so. Thank you. Um, Hidab, you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, thank you, Dr. Walid. Uh, thank you, Dr. Schneier. It's a very informative presentation. Um, my question is to what you alluded to as a normal thing for the vaccine to mutate um, so now that we already know that it has mutated and we have a, a, another version um, that is not just in the, in the UK, but here in, in the US, um, my, my question specifically is regarding 
how how does the vaccine now cover um especially like now for example for for the existing influenza when you're traveling from one country to the other especially like australia for example they tell you you need to be covered for whatever new strain that they have in 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 uh, australia but they don't have here in the us so we, and now that everybody will be required to have a, a vaccine passport if they're going to be traveling mm -hmm. uh, so how do you see that happening now for the COVID? Well, uh, coronaviruses are different than influenza viruses. Uh, influenza viruses are very uh, skilled at changing quickly, and they can change quickly even during you know, a flu season uh, because they're very inefficient replicators and they make a lot of mistakes and they do it so quickly that they can have what's called antigenic drift where it changes a little bit so the vaccine either isn't as effective or isn't effective at, at all. We saw that in 2009 with the H1N1 pandemic that happened. That was kind of a small pandemic, but it was pretty serious. So it's a different virus. Uh, coronaviruses are also, they, they have the ability to kind of go back and fix things a little bit. They do have something called a replicase enzyme um, and they're slow mutators. And the tendency for coronaviruses, you know, remember co the common cold are coronaviruses, right? So uh, this is really a pretty big deal to be able, and we always talk search for the cure for the common cold. Maybe we've we're going to stumble on it with this event, um, is that they're kind of slow to mutate. And because the most of these, all of these vaccines really are targeted towards the spike protein, which is the most important and most conserved part of beta coronaviruses in particular, um, I think we have quite a bit of wiggle room in terms of the emergence of nastier varieties and the vaccine still covering them. That being said, you know, there, I think there's a, a uh, it's important to be vigilant and to look at the, gene, the genetic makeup of, of viruses that are circulating um, and be kind of on top of that so that we may, if we have to, we can tweak the vaccine so that we cover them. And that is being done. It's, not, it's been done very thoroughly in Europe, especially in the, in the UK. That's why they were the ones to be able to pick it up. I have no doubt that this B1117 mutant is flying around the United States. It's more infectious. It isn't necessarily more virulent, more dangerous. Uh, but uh, it does appear to be the dominant strain in Europe now, and it may well become the dominant strain here, but the vaccines appear to be effective. Thank Did you. that answer your question? Hisham? Yes, thank, thank you, Dr. Schreiner. Appreciate yeah. it. Hisham, you have a question for Dr. Schreiner? Yeah, I do. Thanks, thanks, Waleed. Um, I guess I gotta start by saying first time listener, first time caller. <laughs> Um, <laughs> thanks, Dr. Schreiner, certainly for, uh, for sharing your expertise with the community. Um, and I see that there's obviously several individuals on the call with, you know, medical background. So I hope my question is not too much. Basically, I'd like to know what we've learned about long-term effects to those who have acquired the virus. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard that some potential heart or pulmonary side effects, but can you please share what the medical community knows about the virus? and how it may linger to those infected potentially years afterwards? That's an excellent question, and that's a particular interest of mine. I'm, I, I'm, once we get through the sort of mop-up, if you will, of handling the acute problem, I, I'm uh, very interested in looking at you know, the sort of the long haulers or people that have had uh, persistent problems post-COVID. That's why this virus is so dangerous. Um, uh, we don't know very much about its long-term side effects. Um, certainly we know, and I've had this in clinically with some of my patients, people that have had, you know, persistent severe pulmonary disease or perhaps severe neurologic abnormalities, sort of this quote unquote brain fog that happens. We don't know why that happens in some people. Um, it doesn't appear that the, that the virus is, you know, certainly not active in those people months after their infection has resolved, but there may be very serious long-term um, consequences. And I think that there's different ways that that's problematic. The, the first is obviously if you've been on a ventilator, that's that kind of what we call barotrauma, that kind of damage done to your lungs is um, often permanent. And so it may make people very weak from a, a pulmonary standpoint. We know this virus likes to throw clots. It affects the uh, clotting system in the body. And so we do see people with heart attacks or with um, uh, problems with their coronary arteries where they have uh, clots in there that can cause damage to the heart muscle. Um, viruses in general can do things that where they cause the heart muscle to weaken, to weaken and get kind of flabby. We've seen that. Uh, the neurologic stuff is fascinating. Um, so I think as we move forward over the many next years, you know, I think that that's going to be something we're going to learn and hopefully understand more about why these viruses do that. 
They're very interesting viruses and why they make people so sick because they, they just ramp up the immune system. They just turn on the immune system and they kind of make it go haywire. And uh, that's why some of the medications we use are anti-inflammatories, that the one medication that really does seem to work pretty well is a steroid, which helps suppress the immune system a little bit. So unlike HIV, which really suppresses the immune system and people's immune systems poop out and they get these weird infections that they wouldn't get if they had a good immune system, this virus goes in and just wreaks havoc and just turns the immune system on. And that has long-term ramifications that in many different, in complex ways that are way beyond anybody's ability to understand it right now. But that's going to be something going forward. You know, right now we have what? Almost a year's worth of experience with this virus. The first cases were the late part of December in uh, China. So we're not quite up on a year. The one thing I will say, first of all, the, the um, I wanna just, you know, shout out to the healthcare workers, especially the nurses who have dedicated, you know, 11 months of their lives. And these are nurses all over the world dealing with this. This is a horrendously complicated and tragic event. You know, they're often the only person with those patients as they're dying. They may be the me mechanism for the uh, patients to uh, communicate with their families and they have been heroic. The nurses at our hospital have been that, nurses all over the world are doing that. So the healthcare workers, uh, especially the, the frontline folks, the nurses and the respiratory therapists and so forth, really need a lot of credit for this. But the second great achievement is the speed with which we've been able to develop a vaccine. That is a remarkable achievement. In basically 10 months to identify a brand new pathogen, brand new virus, never saw it before, uh, to understand enough about it that you can start developing a vaccine and to do, do it with a new way of making vaccines. That's a great credit to our scientific community. And it speaks, and if I may put a plug in, it speaks to the power of science that facts and truth and data matter to make good decisions and to produce remarkable results. And I think we have to continue to move forward and study this disease very carefully because it probably will help us with other diseases, other inflammatory diseases certainly other viral diseases. Um, and um, whenever you increase your fund of knowledge about things, you can realize, gee, that's what I need to do this time. The HIV pandemic, which is where I started my career, I think I, mean, I started my career with the pandemic and may retire with my career with the pandemic, um, taught us a lot about how to make viral medications. Uh, you know, HIV is a, continues to be a huge scourge on the earth, but we have very, very good therapy now for it. And it's basically totally treatable. We don't have good medications for this disease, but it does look like we have an excellent vaccine. And so I think that that's an enormous achievement. And in spite of all the terrible things that are happening right now around the world and in our society, that's something we can be pretty uh, proud of. Thank you. Uh, Hatem, you have a question? You're muted. <clears throat> thanks, Wally. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to just, uh, first of all, thanks for uh, a great presentation, a very, very informative. Um, I wanted to uh, maybe ask a, a follow-up question related to the neurological impact of, uh, of the, both the disease and the, um, and the vaccine specifically. Uh, you mentioned some diseases. You didn't mention Parkinson's, and I was just curious if there was a potential impact on Parkinson's patients with the vaccine. Uh, that's a good question. You know, that, that group of people, I think we have to be very careful with, um, really not because there's been a long history of neurologic catastrophes with vaccines, although they've been blamed a lot for that. But you know, the, even the Guillain-Barre thing, that kind of came out of a, 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 an outbreak of a swine flu at a time when there was a lot of circulating other um, factors that probably contributed to Guillain-Barre. Guillain-Barre is actually associated with a bacteria, something called Campylobacter. And Dr. Jindy's very familiar with that beast. So, um, uh, but I do think it's a group we need to be careful with. Um, there's nothing about the mRNA vaccines that should exacerbate underlying neurologic problems like MS or, or Parkinson's. You know, we know it causes Parkinson's disease. Um, whether uh, the disease itself, uh, you know, certainly we know that COVID can affect people with Parkinson's and that is a very bad risk factor for, for COVID. Uh, that people with Parkinson's who um, get the disease can often have a very bad outcome. So again, you're always kind of weighing the potential dangers of a vaccine versus its benefit versus the disease itself. And for people that have neurologic problems, you know, MS and ALS and so forth, uh, the benefits of the vaccine, I would think, might really outweigh the, the, any risk, which I, I think is actually pretty small. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lena, you have a question for Dr. Schreiner? 
Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Schreiner, for an excellent presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, I, I read an article that, uh, you know, the flu shot um, or vaccine uh, may provide partial immunity uh, against uh, the coronavirus. Yeah, that, I, I, it's interesting. Um, some of you might have received the BCG vaccine. That's a common vaccine given in, in other, par other parts of the world besides the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's been noted that people that had BCG, uh, the tuberculosis vaccine, are seem to be less susceptible to COVID. It's kind of an anecdotal observation. There isn't real good science behind it, but it is something to be observed. And that may spill over into some other vaccines, including potentially influenza. I will tell you, however, that the vast, you know, many, 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 many people in my hospital right now that have COVID, I'm sure got the flu shot. So um, we can't count on that as a protective mechanism. But there, there may be something about some types of vaccines. The BCG vaccine is kind of a weird vaccine and it stimulates lymphocytes. Um, uh, and so that may have some effect on kind of tamping down the immune response that you get when you, when you acquire COVID. Uh, a very interesting observation I've made when, when the pandemic first started breaking, I was really worried about my, I do a lot of HIV work, my patient population, because their immune systems, you know, even though they're on very good medications and they're restored, they're still immune compromised and they don't do well with influenza. They get really sick with influenza, even if their uh, HIV is well controlled. So I thought, oh God, this is going to be terrible. And months went by before I ever had a patient that had COVID. And I've had three patients now that have had it, all of which have been very mild disease. And why is that? Well, we first thought maybe it was the HIV meds and we've tried to use them to treat COVID. That didn't work. My very first patient, I used Kalitra, which is a, an HIV medication, didn't work. Um, so maybe there's something about their immune system when they're restored on antiretroviral therapy, or, or this is a really wild thing, maybe there's something about having HIV that protects you. Uh, so that of course is not a, you know, we're not gonna infect the world with HIV to protect people from COVID. But obviously there's some sort of immune thing going on here, whether it's with the vaccine or another virus that's doing something that's interrupting um, SARS-CoV-2's ability to infect a person. So it's an interesting observation. I, the flu vaccine certainly isn't going to be the way out of the pandemic, uh, but it is an interesting and important piece of information to keep an eye on. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Khan, you had a question for Dr. Shiner? Or Ajno, you're, 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 you're muted. You're muted. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you so much, Dr. Schreiner. That was a wonderful presentation. <clears throat> and I must say, my respect for research has just quadrupled after this. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> my question is um, can the, those who are um, fully vaccinated with the second dose, can they be carriers? That's uh, the biggest that's a good question. I, I didn't touch on that. And that's a really important question. So a lot of people say, well, can I just take my mask off and you know, roll around in COVID and I don't need to worry about it? The answer to that is no, uh, because we don't know whether people can still carry it and pass it on to somebody who's either not responded to the vaccine, of which there will be some people, um, or somebody who's not immune, someone who can't have the vaccine for whatever reason or doesn't want the vaccine. Um, so that's why we want people, you're still gonna have to wear masks and be very careful when you're around people that have not been vaccinated. Um, and uh, the, that was why I presented that rhesus macaque data, because in that study, those animals, they looked at, they, they, you know, they really blasted them with SARS-CoV-2. They took a little pipette and injected that right into their nostrils. And you can see that one little slide there where the, the virus just disappeared. So their immune system was able to get in there and control it. We think with these two vaccines that actually they will diminish the amount of virus that you can carry and prevent that from being spread. And that would be a huge thing. That would be really important to get this thing under control quickly is that if the virus goes to you, if, as long as you're not carrying it around in your nose, you can't give it to somebody else. Uh, but that's a, we don't know that for sure yet. And so uh, the animal data supports it. Again, Fauci, uh, you know, he's, he was involved in the Moderna trial. And so he obviously has privy to all kinds of information. They do think that that's the case. They're looking at that with Pfizer as well. That, that being vaccinated decreases your ability to spread it to other people. Uh, but that isn't always the case with vaccines. And so we have to be really careful and keep people wearing masks. Uh, you said if it's, if, it's to, if it's in the nose, where else could it, I mean? 
Well, once it gets, that's the portal of entry for most SARS-CoV-2. That's why, you know, so many people that have had COVID um, lose their sense of taste and smell. You hear that's a very common symptom yeah. for people. And um, that's because the nasal epithelium, your nose is where all those ACE2 uh, receptors are. That's the favorite receptor that this virus likes to go to. And those line your whole uh, respiratory tract, including your lungs, but they're also in other places. They're in fat tissue. So uh, people that are morbidly obese, that's why they are very high risk for uh, having bad outcomes with COVID because they have so much, so many ACE2 receptors that the virus just kind of goes everywhere and they just have a huge burden of disease. There's other reasons why obesity increases the risk as well, but that's one of them. Uh, we know that the testes are a, a sanctuary for um, COVID, that there's a lot of ACE2 receptors there. That may be why men don't do as well as women when they get COVID, they have a higher mortality. Uh, there's probably some other factors there as well, but that may be one of them. So, uh, so once it gets in, it can disseminate other places. Um, uh, cardiac cells certainly express a lot of ACE2, gastrointestinal cells, um, uh, uh, one of uh, Dr. Sh uh, Shindy's colleagues and I have a case of a young woman who developed ulcerative colitis from COVID. Um, she had no lung problems at all, um, but she had horrible colitis. And um, there's lots of ACE2 receptors all along the, um, in the bowel. So that may have been why she got it there. So, and those are potential areas of spread, but the most common area is coughing and, and harboring it up here in your upper respiratory tract. One more question, a simpler question. Um, oh, what was that? <laughs> oh, pe people with autoimmune dis disorders, uh, how, how do they do with the vaccination and the disease itself? So yeah, those are going to be the groups we're going to have to follow. And, you know, most of those people were excluded from the studies. It's like I said, study patients are not, no are not normal people. They're different because they're, they're usually healthy. You don't want to do studies on people that are really compromised. But so that's going to be a population we're going to have to watch very carefully. Um, but a lot of those people are on immunosuppressive agents. So we want to make sure they respond to the vaccine. Um, you know, we wouldn't withhold those, those medications. We don't want them to have a flare of their lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or something. I think the, these vaccines, these mRNA vaccines in particular, will be safe with them. Again, you, you don't hear about people with the exception of anaphylaxis. You really don't hear about people dying from getting a vaccine. They may, you know, people always say that you know, there's always my patients are saying, well, last time I got the flu shot, I got the flu. You can't get influenza from the flu shot. It's a killed vaccine. There's no live virus in there. But when do we give the flu vaccine? During the flu season. So you can have been exposed to the flu on Tuesday and gotten your shot on Wednesday. And on Thursday, you've got the flu because you didn't have time to develop immunity. And um, so that's, you know, that's when people say, well, the vaccine gave me the disease. They really don't. Now, there are live attenuated vaccines occasionally that, that can. The yellow fever vaccine is a no picnic. That's a dangerous vaccine. You have to, many people get it. I've gotten it when I go to Africa, but it's a little scary. It can cause bad things to your liver. So these vaccines are very, very safe. And the most important thing is we know that COVID is a very bad disease and it's very unpredictable. You, I, you know, we have, I have a 48 or 40, 44 year old guy right now who I'm really worried about. He's hanging in there, but he's pretty darn sick. And, you know, our very first patient at Huntington was a 36-year-old patient, and he died. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Omar al <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Dr. Schreiner, for this uh, very educational session. And thanks to Walid, by the way, that's uh, an awesome session, really. My question is about the herd uh, immunity. Uh, could you help us explain how it works because the kind of uh, signals that we got from the media, I think, and um, the administration, it was kind of a convoluted. <laughs> well, first of all, Trump referred to it as herd mentality. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a that's a Trump rally. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so, um, so herd immunity. I, I you know I go to Africa, as you know, as Dr. Shindy told you, and one of my favorite things is to be on the Serengeti, and we always go. We often go. In, in February when the migration is on and you hear, you know, you see all these wildebeest and zebras and, and all mm -hmm. kinds of animals migrating uh, down through the beautiful plains of the Serengeti. So herd immunity is that um, a point where, or where, the, where everybody in the herd, in the community, uh, has achieved either immunity from natural infection or from vaccination. And when that happens then, the pathogen, the virus, has nowhere to go. If everybody in the, in the household is immune to COVID, COVID has nowhere to go and it just 
fizzles out and dies. And to do that on a grand scale, to do it in the country, you know, in the United States or around the world, you have to get about 60 to 70 percent of the of the herd immune. And the, the, the point of herd immunity is a couple of things. The first is to basically extinguish the pandemic. That's the most important thing right now. But the other part of herd immunity is that even though not everybody's been vaccinated, those that haven't been vaccinated or who can't get the vaccine or who don't respond to the vaccine are still protected because most of the herd has had the either had the disease or is vaccinated. Yeah. And so it has nowhere to go. Yeah. And so it's really an epidemiologic tool, not an individual tool. But it, for this particular situation, this is when herd immunity is so very, very important. Now, for something as infectious as this virus, you have to have much higher levels of immunity in that herd to get it to go away. If it's only 40%, it's still gonna have places to go because it's so infectious. Less infectious things, frankly, influenza is not as infectious as this one, can peter out pretty quickly if um, you have 40% of the herd is immune. But for this virus, we've really got to get up to 60 to 70% to finally put an end to this pandemic. And that's, that's why it's so important that people accept the vaccine uh, and get it rather than, you know, we don't want you to get COVID as a way of pre achieving that. You heard about these guys that wanted to do the natural immunity. That would cost millions more people to die. And that's not acceptable. And we have another way of doing this that's safe and effective and will save lives, not kill people. Did that sort of help you? Awesome, thank you. So really we're all a bunch of wildebeests. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I have Khalid Suleiman, please. Question for Dr. Shrang. Let me, okay. Thank you, Doctor, for sharing the information with us. Before actually I listened to your lecture, I wanted to take the vaccine but now I'm very comfortable to take the vaccine. Good for My you. question awesome. to you is, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> My question to you is, how are we gonna get the vaccine? Is it through our religious centers, community centers, our insurance plan, I that, I was or we stand in line for us? Yeah, so that's, that's the big question. And the truth is, is that that's gonna change a little bit. You know, that's been the great, tragedy with this pandemic, at least in the United States, is the really disorganized, bad control of the pandemic itself and uh, not a good rollout for the vaccine. So um, I, I, the, the, you know, that, President Biden's gonna have to really hit the ground running. He's already got a, you know, an amazing group of people together that they're gonna get this thing sorted out. The way it's gonna go right now for LA County is my understanding, I just spoke to the public health department people today, um, is that Right now we've got it, we've got all the health, pretty much the healthcare workers are, are powering through their vaccines right now and getting vaccinated. And I'm pleased to see that even at our institution, we've had a, we've, we've given over 3,900 vaccines in about 10, about, well, two weeks. And that's a, that's a great achievement. Okay. And people have a pretty high acceptance rate. Um, so for the, for the next step, then it's the nursing homes and the caregivers in the nursing homes. Then it, they're gonna begin to open it up quickly. And some of these are gonna overlap. So my understanding is in the next few weeks, the next group, which is sort of the, the last part of tier one, will be people with immune compromised situations or people that are greater than 75 years old. And these vaccines can be given in different ways. Walgreens, CVS, and Vons, and apparently just now Ralph's have agreed to be vaccine sites where you can um, go online, you make an appointment and you go in and get your first dose and then you return and uh, probably, these are all Moderna vaccines. So you'll return in four weeks for the second booster. Um, the county, both LA County and Pasadena City Public Health Departments are having what are called um, M-pods, which are sort of, you know, sort of a giant uh, Dodger Stadium, Rose Bowl kind of deal where you, again, you go online, you get, you sign up, you get an appointment time, and then you go to that venue and you, and you get your vaccine. And LA County is doing that now very efficiently. Uh, Pasadena Public Health has just started their rollout and that's going pretty well. The big problem is that we've got this pandemic going on We've got a big surge going on. So all the people that would normally be able to give vaccines, all the nurses and the pharmacists and so forth, they're busy dealing with the catastrophes that are at the hospital. And we don't have a lot of personnel. So that's, that's been a little bit of a hang up. But that's beginning to change. And I think that, that the federal government, the new federal government's going to probably also you know, pull in the, maybe some of the, the medical corps from the military to help get this done so that we can get lots and lots of people vaccinated as quickly as possible. 
So just kind of, if you, if you want to be alert, uh, check out the LA County coronavirus website or, or the Pasadena Public Health Department website. They have a different little channels that you can look at that will tell you when they think that it's going to be available for your group. Um, and then um, there'll be a way of facilitating that. But I think there's going to be, it's going to be pretty speedy in the next two or three weeks. Now, a lot of that is dependent on the amount of vaccine. And there are catastrophes. Uh, we had a, the vaccines come in like pizza boxes. They're, they're called pizza boxes. And because they have to be kept so cold, there's a little monitor on the top of the box. If the box has been breached or the temperature's gotten too warm, there's a light that comes on and then you can't use that whole vaccine. And those are, there's about usually 900 vials in there and there's five doses in each vial. So uh, we had one that happened that way. So there's gonna be hangups. You know, somebody gets a delivery of pork chops instead of a vaccine and Bob's you know, bar and grill got the vaccine because somebody screwed up the, yeah. the UPS and UPS and FedEx are delivering these vaccines all over the country. So there's lots of potential for human error here, um, but it's happening and it'll get better and more organized in the next few weeks. So just watch those two sites. Hmm. Um, there may be, yeah. uh, I know they're reaching out to, uh, to uh, churches and mosques and, and, um, and all different religious groups to sort of, because that's an area where people can get information on where they go to get their vaccines. Um, and you guys can, can be part of this. I mean, encourage people, they're safe, they're effective, they're our only way out of this. And so the more people that get vaccinated, the better it's going to be, the faster we'll begin to get back to normal. I'm planning on, I'm hoping to take a trip to France in September uh, and get on an airplane. And I'm hoping to take 60 doctors and nurses and veterinarians to Africa in 2022. So, um, but this is the only way out. We can't do this any other way. And so it is important to get, to get the vaccine. Okay. So, well, well uh, for example, I have uh, Kaiser insurance. Will Kaiser administer the vaccine yeah. or I have to go to the county? No, Kaiser... Kaiser's on their own. They, they, they've been getting vaccine. Uh, they'll start that. They'll notify you. Kaiser's already kind of got a built-in framework that's probably, it'll be actually quite easy for you. What won't probably happen is doctor's offices probably won't be administering the vaccine. It's, it's too hard to handle the, these two vaccines. The, certainly the Pfizer is really only in hospitals, but the hospital itself may start being a potential place for vaccinations for people uh, in, in Pasadena, for example, because if we're, if we're given a lot of Pfizer and we've burned through all of our healthcare workers and we have extra, then we may start running some clinics for people to come in and get vaccinated. Doctors' offices, their staff that are not affiliated with the hospital but need to be vaccinated. We want to get everybody vaccinated on the planet. <laughs> so. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Joan. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, Hala. Hala Karam. Sorry. Question. You're muted, Hala. much, Dr. Schreiner. This is so very interesting, and I really appreciate you sharing your expertise. I had two questions. I actually put them in the chat, but yeah. first one is, I'm asthmatic, and I was hearing early on that there was, and I'm very thankful for this messenger RNA platform and everything, but my question is, as an asthmatic, I heard that there were some sensitivity reactions to people that took the, you know, the vaccine, few people that took the vaccine early on. Um, and I was curious if I should wait, you know, and see, I think I heard there were testing sensitive populations, you know, to see what, what was going on with those allergic populations. So is there any need to be, you know, extra to well, wait a little bit? Yeah, you know, as I said, when you go from a study of 33,000 people to 30 million people, you're going to you get a better sense of what might be some problems. And I, I do think, you know, we have to be prepared for the fact that there may be some events that happen that we didn't predict could happen um, as we move into larger populations of people. But that being said, uh, you know, we've got, what, about three weeks of vaccinations, four weeks of vaccinations going on in the country. There have been maybe four real anaphylaxis reactions, not a lot. Uh, we know that asthma is not something you want. You don't want to get COVID if you have asthma because that's, you know, we know the pulmonary disease increases your risk for a bad outcome. So again, it's the risk of the disease is much worse than the, than the vaccine. These vaccines, what we do when you get the vaccine, you sit there for about 15 minutes. For people who've had a history of anaphylaxis, and there are, you know, there are people that really have other kinds of diseases that can precipitate that, they sit there for 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so we've had a few things in the hospital. Like I said, we've done about 3,900 vaccinations. We've had 
most of it's been sort of anxiety. You know, I, people kind of hyperventilate. We had one person pass out yesterday. I think it was just sort of the the drama of the event. She didn't have any evidence of a of anaphylactic reaction. We've not had any cases of anaphylaxis. Um, so, um, you know, it is safe. It does appear to be safe in people with all kinds of pulmonary disease. You know, asthma is a very common uh, problem in the community and lots of folks who get with asthma are getting vaccinated and doing okay. So I would encourage you to get the vaccine. Thank you so much. And my second question is, you mentioned the messenger RNA um, platform has been around for decades. What made, and it wasn't as effective maybe previously, but what was different in this one that made it work? It's the ability to do it. Um, the, Dr. Uh, uh, Carico, the, the, the sort of, everybody wanted the idea, well, we, you know, we can use this technology to, to, for example, for cancer. We can just send in some information to make the body make antibodies to cancer cells. You know, that's so you can get very specific and it's being done for that. But the problem was, is when you just injected the, the recipe into somebody's body, the, the immune system went along and goes, oh, I don't know that, and it gobbled it up and it disappeared. So what Dr. Carrico did is by putting it in this little package, the body couldn't recognize it. It just kind of slipped in there. It's like, it's called a Trojan horse. It kind of slipped in behind the gates and then opened up and there was all the goodies. So, um, th so there was a lot of problems with the technology over the years, but that's become very sophisticated now. And this virus was the perfect place to try this out. Like I said, it came to fruition with the Zika vaccine, but that vaccine never was rolled out because the Zika pandemic kind of disappeared. Um, and it may not be an effective platform for you know, other kinds of diseases. For example, there's something called dengue fever, dengue hemorrhagic fever, bad viral disease, very hard to make a vaccine for it. It didn't work for HIV. Uh, mRNA technologies were looked at for HIV. HIV is going to be a very, I think we're going to cure HIV before we find a vaccine for it. So, mm -hmm. so it may not be for everything, but for this type of virus, it seemed like the perfect time. And I think everybody was just blown away about how effective it was. So it works. It's just it's science has evolved. We just are much more skilled at doing it. We know how to, you know, these guys can manipulate these little micro particles really well. And it's pretty darn amazing. That's amazing. A silver lining in all of this challenging. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's the legacy. I think it will be the legacy for all the people who've perished from COVID is this science that's come out of this, so. Thank you very much. Well, it's not my turn, but uh, when it's my turn, I'll ask. Okay. Sister Joan, did you uh, have a question? Yes, yes. Thank you, Dr. Schreiner. It's a very stimulating and informative uh, session. I'm thinking of the book, Emotional Intelligence, where it talked about if uh, an elderly person and a younger person fell off a boat, which one would you save first? <laughs> My question is, why are we not giving vaccines to younger people first rather than older people who've lived a longer life? Well, that's a, you know, we're facing that question right now at our hospital, not because of the vaccine, but of resources. And that's a really terrible decision to have to make. Um, so for this situation, we do know that younger people um, don't get as sick with this disease. Uh, they, they don't, the mortality in the sort of 18 to 45 year old crowd is much, much lower than it is when you get above that. And certainly much lower than people above 75. Uh, so that's the reason why that's been targeted first. Now we do know, however, that the, the younger people are super spreaders. They really can spread the disease. And you can make an argument from a purely epidemiologic standpoint that, you know, the best way to put the fire right. out is, to, is to extinguish the, the flamethrower there, if you will. Um, but uh, that being said, there are some, you know, there's some Im important ethical things. You know, the, the po patient population in skilled nursing facilities, there was kind of some controversy about that, not because they weren't recognized as a highly vulnerable population, which they are, um, but because they don't develop really good immune responses. And so the, the concern was, you know, we're going to waste all this vaccine on people that really don't mount a very good immune response. I don't think that's going to be the case. I do think you have to have ethics as part of the plan for uh, how to deal with a pandemic. And so um, I think, again, there's going to be so much overlap, I think, in the next few weeks and months with everybody having access to the, the vaccine pretty quickly that it's all going to be sort of irrelevant and Hopefully it'll, it'll just really get this thing under control. Uh, but there was a, quite a bit of thought as to who should be the first people that get it. I don't think anybody questioned the healthcare worker thing because we, you know, if the hospitals collapse in a community, which they are on the verge of right now, uh, that's a catastrophe on, all on its, you know, whole nother problem. But, um, 
but I think in terms of sort of the the who gets next, you know, is a is a grocery person more important than a than a teacher? You know, I mean, those sort of things are really hard decisions, and we hope that that really is going to be irrelevant as the vaccine is rolled out quickly. Thank you. Um, the next question is, I don't know anybody personally who's gotten the COVID, uh, or I mean, died from it. I'm trying to really understand the amount of people who have died for it in a practical manner. But I was wondering, have you noticed anything about hygiene as to who gets COVID more easily, such no, as people no. cleaning groceries when they bring them home, washing their hands? I mean, I'm wondering, other well, than what you talked about. We want people to, to you know, practice good hygiene. The truth is, is that although it could be transmitted from sort of high touch services, you know, computer keyboards and telephones and so forth. That's not a very common way. The most common way for COVID to be transmitted is from one family member to another. Most transmission occurs not at the workplace, although some certainly do, but at, in the home. And, you know, this virus doesn't care that the person who is being infected is your mom or your son or your brother or your cousin. It just wants to go to somebody who doesn't have immunity. And so that's why it, it's so awful to, I, I sort of have to be the, the you know, scolder all the time and say, don't get together for Christmas, don't get together for the holidays, you, know, you don't get together for Thanksgiving. These are all good things that help keep society robust and healthy when you're doing positive things with people that you love and, and building that bond. But it's a terrible thing to do with a really infectious pathogen in a pandemic. And so um, most viruses transmitted from people that you know and it doesn't take much of an event. You know, it's a meal, basically. It's the, it's the taking the mask off during a meal, uh, talking to people, and it's such an infectious virus that, boy, it just finds somebody that hasn't had it, and it goes. And, you know, we, we have, last week, we had six family members in the hospital, two of whom died. Uh, and, you know, often it's it's just a terrible tragedy. And, the, and these are the the legacies of people that are going to, you know, that are experiencing this, there's going to be a lot of emotional fallout from this pandemic of people that have lost people, people who brought the virus home into their family and spread it around inadvertently. You know, people don't do it on purpose, but right. it's just, it, so it's, so, you know, wearing a mask, keeping social distant and keeping it really to a small, just your household right now, especially right now, there is so much disease out there. One in 50 people in LA County are infected probably. So even going to the grocery store now is a far more dangerous thing than it was back in March. So if we can just ride out the next four weeks, get a lot of people vaccinated, get over the surge, uh, it'll be a lot safer. And Thank you. How we do it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Trod. Uh, thank you, Dr. Schreiner, for this very informative presentation. Um, my question is, um, under, I, I mean, I heard today that President-elect Biden, soon to be President Biden, uh, was talking about releasing all the vaccine rather than holding us uh, for the booster. Um, is the intent just to increase initial shots in arm with the idea that under Biden, the manufacturing and distribution will increase so people can get their boosters on time? Or is it that they are actually talking about just giving the initial doses and then delaying and how would that impact uh, effectiveness and this eventual herd immunity that we want to reach? Yeah, so those are good questions. And I think I, my understanding is that, and you know, Tony Fauci is on his, I mean, he really is going to be a voice that will be heard this time instead of a voice in the wilderness there. But um, uh, the, um, uh, the idea is, is that because these vaccines are pretty easy to crank out in high volume, is let's just get everything we've got right now, get it out there, get it in arms, get people vaccinated, and then just start really ramping up manufacturing, um, you know, pumping money. He's going to pump a lot of money into not just, you know, this part of the stimulus thing is to, for the pharmaceutical companies to really crank out production uh, of, both, of both the vaccines. You know, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is close to being approved. I, I think these two vaccines may be the big players in this because they're just so effective. Uh, but um, I think the plan is to get everybody vaccinated and, and just assume with this really, you know, important effort to crank out more vaccine that everybody's going to get their second blast as well. Uh, the English 
have been a little more kind of disorganized. You know, they, they also have, you know, prime, the prime minister's a little bit of a kook and you know, they're having a terrible, <laughs> uh, he's not quite the kook that we had, but, but still a little bit. It's something about bla bad blonde hair. <laughs> At any rate, I should probably shouldn't be quite so political. It's late in the evening. It's a Friday night, so I'll let let it rip a little bit. But anyway, um, I, their idea—they're just having a terrible time over there. Um, and there's the you know the English tradition of getting back in the pub is really everybody's chomping at the bit. So they just figure if they get everybody vaccinated as quickly as possible, then they can achieve you know some herd immunity. Then maybe they'll be able to get the vaccine out of it as well. Uh, but uh, we have a little bit, Moderna's made here in this country, um, yeah, Pfizer's made a little bit in this country, but a lot of it's made in Europe. So, so we can crank out a lot of the Moderna quickly. That's going to be the main one in the community, I think. And so I don't think Biden's intending on forgetting about the second dose, but I think he just wants to get as many people vaccinated as soon as possible to get us out of this mess because it's bad. Well, it sounds like um, you're very optimistic that they'll be able to increase manufacturing and distribution so it won't be an issue. So thank you for that. I uh, appreciate it. And, and, and before anybody worries that, yes, our heater works in the house. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm, I'm wearing this because it's, it's the second anniversary of my trip to Antarctica a photography expedition. And if you need any photographers for your trip to Africa, uh, I, I'll be happy to join you. Oh, well, I will take you up on that. We've had some great photographers and I would, that's, that's on my, my, somebody was asking me yesterday, I did a piece for the LA Times on traveling. Um, I have no desire to go on a cruise except to Antarctica and the Galapagos. Those are the two places that I want to go. So that's, that's on my to-do list. So we'll need to talk to Rick and find out. Yeah, that. sounds great. Uh, we actually have COVID in Antarctica. It was the last continent that didn't have it, but one of the research stations had a big outbreak. So. Oh no. Yeah. So, Sister Lenya, you have a question for Dr. Shiner? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Walid, and thank you, Dr. Schreiner, for all this information. Um, I wanted just to add to uh, your discussion earlier about the BCG vaccine and possible immunity, because I, even before you mentioned that, it kind of answered some of my questions. Um, but uh, um, I was wondering about the, like we've noticed that the infection rates and mortality rates in the rest of the world and the, in the less developed world seems to be less. And uh, my husband is from Yemen and he's on, on, constantly in contact with people there and, and has talked to many people who got COVID and, um, and tried to give them advice. He's, he's kind of a barefoot doctor. He's not really a doctor, but a barefoot doctor. Gave them a lot of advice and a lot of people got better um, but the, the severity of the spread didn't seem to be as much in places like Yemen or um, we've been to Africa and, you know, a lot of developed countries didn't have the severity of mortality that the developed countries did. Is there something about people having, be, being exposed to so many other uh, infections? I mean, we know we've been through malaria, we've been through uh, typhoid. Typhoid, we've been through Belharsi, we've been through so many things in Yemen. I lived there for 27 years. Is there something about already having some kind of immunity to uh, things like COVID that come along? That's, a, I mean, that's an excellent question. You're, you're absolutely right. There's been um, an observation that there, the amount of disease is less in some countries. Now, the problem with that is some of the chickens are coming to home to roost here because um, that, it, for, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is where I work, in general, the population is younger. Um, mm -hmm. the, most of the and that's I think that's true in the Middle East as well. That, that the general population, most people are not in their 70s and 80s. Certainly in Yemen, that's the case. That's yeah, and so that so that's part of it. Probably that's probably the biggest factor. There mm -hmm. may be something um, to do with um, having had BCG, and and as you pointed out, there may be some sort of situation, and it may not even be cross reactivity with coronavirus. It may be that it's changed your immune system a little bit. To handle viruses in a different way, and that because of a disease like schistosomiasis or bilharzia, or a disease like um, leishmaniasis, of which there's a lot in the Middle East and stuff, those, those all affect lymphocytes. And this disease, COVID, is sort of a lymphocyte-driven disease. So mm -hmm. maybe there's something about that. Maybe that's the connection with HIV. You know, I think this is a fascinating topic. The problem is, is you know, we're in the middle of the soup right now, so it's kind of hard to study everything. It's I always have this 
vision of a scientist in the middle of a big pot of soup with their microscope trying to study the soup as all this stuff is swirling around. It's, it's hard to do it in the middle of a pandemic. But when we look back on yeah. that, or when we have an opportunity to be reflective about sort of what hit us this year, um, that may be in a very important factor. In Tanzania, where I work, uh, unfortunately, they have a, a kind of a bully for a president right now, and he has denied the existence of COVID. And so I think there's a lot of people, I, we have uh, several young people we put through medical school over there. I think Waleed met Ezekiel, I can't remember if you met mm -hmm. one of our folks, um, but he was saying there's plenty of people dying of COVID there, there's nobody, it's not reported because it, he did this smuggle. Yeah, I know there's the problem with the reporting is certainly. Yeah, an issue. but I do think there is some real difference. And I think some of that is, is that there may be something about the way the immune system behaves having been exposed to so many other pathogens. Maybe, you know, we've paid the price for having sort of a, a, a pretty well-protected hygienic society in the United States. You know, I always, I don't have kids, but if I had kids, I would have really encouraged them to eat dirt and roll around in the dirt and <laughs> It's a good thing for your immune system to be exposed to stuff like that. So, um, so anyway, my, I think that's a very interesting observation, and I think will be an important one. And I think you're absolutely right that there may be something about these diseases that do something to the immune system that may be mm -hmm. somewhat protective, not 100% protective. Something to, to to study later on. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much. A, we have a question from the chat. Um, since each treatment is meant to consist of two doses, but if only one dose is given, what is the longest you can wait to get the second dose in the event there are not enough doses to cover two treatments for each recipient? Well, we don't know that answer for sure. The manufacturers, both Pfizer and, and um, uh, Moderna, say sort of plus or minus two days on each side. But it's possible that you know a week or two might not make that much of a difference. Uh, again, you're stimulating the immune system to remember something that it's already been sort of um, charged with, and so um, we know, like with you know with hepatitis and stuff, that those vaccines you know do the job six months later. So um, there may be a little longer, more leeway, and, and that may be something that'll help the the British you know get their second vaccines out there. Maybe not exactly at the time. You know, all of this is kind of studies that. They're done looking at the half-life, the, the sort of duration of the virus and the, what it's doing to the immune system and the ability of the cells to respond. There is something about getting that second dose pretty quickly so that it, it really you know, gives you a second blast. And I can tell you that, that today I, I felt a little bit kind of meh because this was my second dose. I can feel sort of my immune system. I'm feeling, actually, as I'm doing this lecture, I'm feeling, feeling much better. So thank you all for... <laughs> distracting me while I was getting kind of sort of crawly skin, but um, I think that uh, that uh, that there may be some more leeway than we know. We just don't know yet. Uh, yes, thank you so much, uh, Noha Abdu. Question for Dr. Schreiner. You are muted. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Schreiner, for this frank and and fun conversation and a very informative. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. Um, I have a question. What do you think is the efficacy of the vaccine with for people that are part of the rare diseases community, such as histiocytosis X? Um, is it safe to take the vaccine if you're part of that community, or, or what are your thoughts? Well, you know, the, the truth is we don't know. But again, the, the kind of vaccines that these are um, I think would be unlikely to be, I think they actually might be safer than the adenovirus vaccines. Adenovirus vaccines, which is what the AstraZeneca vaccine is, it's a chimp adenovirus. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people have been exposed to a lot of different types of adenovirus and sometimes by re-challenging them, that's the, that's the sort of carrier for the vaccine information that they may develop kind of unusual immune responses. And so, so I think because these vaccines don't have any of that information that they actually might be safer, but the truth is we don't really know. And, um, and there are so many different types of unusual autoimmune diseases that we are going to learn that. Um, you know, again, this is not a live vaccine. I would never give a live vaccine to somebody with those type of disorders. Um, uh, this is not a, a, even a live attenuated vaccine. This is you know, just it's a piece of material that goes in and stimulates the, the body to make this protein that then causes the immune response. So um, so I, I think they're gonna turn out to be safe, but we don't really know. And so we wanna be careful. That, that may be a reason to wait a little bit, depending on what the autoimmune diseases are. Now, we do know, however, when you have those diseases, that if you get COVID, it can be bad. 
and we've had several, uh, I had a patient had lupus and died, it was not good. Um, and um, uh, patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis or uh, those sort of things, you know, so um, again, it's this risk benefit sort of thing. Um, you know, as we begin to vaccinate more and more people and we start including people that have immune disorders in that group, we may, um, we'll, learn in, we'll learn information and, you know, again, this, this type of platform I think is going to be pretty safe because it really doesn't have anything in there that should cause trouble that I know of. I mean, we have to rely on the manufacturers. I don't know what exactly what the difference is between the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine that allows them to have two different patents, um, but it's not anything, I don't think there's any kind of um, really horrible thing in there that could cause a big problem in somebody whose immune system's a little rickety. Thank you. Uh, my wife has a question for you, Dr. Schreiner. Hi, Dr. Yeah. Schreiner. I'm a big fan. Um, <laughs> I have I have two questions, um, and I know it's a long been a long night for you, but um, please bear with me. Favorite call. Who knew I would become a coronavirus expert? I used to be <laughs> <an> expert. <laughs> So the first one is, how well represented were minorities in the trials and the results? And like, how are they reacting? To, are they reacting differently? Are you seeing any differences? So the, the Pfizer, uh, both of them had some. It wasn't the most diverse group. Um, they had quite a few African Americans um, in the Pfizer trial, uh, and they had some Hispanics. Part of the Pfizer trial was done in Argentina. So they had a fairly big Hispanic population there. Um, but it wasn't the most diverse. It was probably less diverse just in terms of, of disorders like immune disorders and age than ethnicity. But there wasn't a lot of diversity. It was largely still a predominantly Caucasian population. Um, but there doesn't appear to be any kind of, I mean, I think there were, was enough data that it didn't seem to suggest that there would be any kind of um, unusual reactions in different ethnicities, uh, unless they had an underlying genetic disease of some sort um, that would cause problems. Um, but um, I think the biggest challenge is going to be, and this is where you all come in, because the more people I talk to, uh, we want people to really try to ask questions of friends and so forth, especially people that are in very high risk groups, African Americans, lower socioeconomic people, the Latinx population, are people that are afraid of vaccines is um, is to encourage people to get vaccinated, and that's been the the history in the United States of bad things happening to people of lower socioeconomic status or different ethnicities is going to is coming back to haunt us a little bit. And some of you may have known about the Tuskegee syphilis study, which was a horrendously mm -hmm. awful thing. That wasn't a vaccine. That was not was withholding treatment for syphilis. But I think it's going to be a challenge. I just was uh, talking to some colleagues that were at another hospital and only 20% of their African-American staff got wanted the vaccine. So, um, and that's, we're gonna have to figure out what, how to get over that because it just, they're at very high risk and we need to make sure that we address the inequities that have happened in the past, but also say, we're trying not to do that now. We need to get you vaccinated to protect you. So. So unfortunately, the trials, you can't really turn to those too much, but they did have a pretty, made an effort to have a mixture. And my second question is, is there any benefit to taking either of the vaccines or even a benefit to waiting in for the, let's say, the Novavax vaccine? I wouldn't wait uh, because it's a bad disease. I, I felt like in, in that the last 11 months has been like whack-a-mole trying to make sure that I don't get this thing. <laughs> and, um, and I think initially I was kind of like everybody else. I remember some of the first meetings we had when we used to have meetings in person and we we're like, yeah, yeah, maybe you might as well just get it and get it over with and you get immunity. You don't want this disease. It's bad. It's really, it can kill you and it's really dangerous and can really harm you. So um, I wouldn't wait too long. Now, I, again, with uh, with an underlying disorder that might be a, an immunologic disorder, it might be reasonable to wait a little bit just to see as we begin to accrue more people, are we starting to see some problems? But, you know, we've already got, I think there's been 2 million doses used already. So, and we haven't heard of any horrible things that have happened. Um, so I wouldn't wait. I don't think it's worth waiting for one of the, the Novavax looks very good, but they haven't finished their phase three trial. And that's a different way of doing vaccines that may have some problems. 
the Johnson and Johnson trial, they, they had, a, they stopped that trial because of some side effect and they never were very transparent about what that was, um, which is a little disconcerting. And the AstraZeneca vaccine is the one that had two cases of transverse myelitis, which is a spinal cord abnormality. Now, they came out and said that that was just due to what, the, you know, wasn't related to the vaccine. But I have to say that in conjunction with kind of the big goof up in the dosing with them makes me a little less comfortable with the safety of that whole protocol, which is unfortunate because that came out of Oxford. It was a, you know, it's a very notable, and AstraZeneca is a very, you know, well-established uh, pharmaceutical company. So I wouldn't wait if you don't have any other underlying abnormalities uh, and there's no advantage of one over the other in terms of Moderna or Pfizer. And I don't think that the, the next ones that come down the pike are going to be that much better. I actually think that, that these vaccines will be better than the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. That, that vaccine is going to be helpful to use because it doesn't require the deep refrigeration, but it's, um, it may be only 60 or 70% effective. These are, you know, 95% is a pretty darn good statistic. So. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Dr. Abat, and then Dima, and then Tarek. So I understand that uh, we're not supposed to take any other vaccine 14 days before our first dose of a COVID vaccine. And um, my question is, what about if somebody has taken a tetanus booster and a prophylactic shingles dose and then nine days later got their first dose of COVID, will that detrimentally affect um, the prognosis? Is that somebody that you know? <laughs> yeah, it was me. Are, are you, that sounds like you're still okay, right? Feel okay? Yeah, no, it's about, was it effective? Because I just remembered on the paper, it said uh, in the consent form as I was signing it, you, you don't take any vaccines 14 days before right. Right. Uh, your COVID vaccine. And I started remembering, oh, I took my tetanus booster nine days ago. Uh, it was tetanus and, and shingles or something, but yeah. these were just, I was taking them that was for being of, a good girl. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do you I, think I, that would have undermined yeah. the effect of my first dose? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. It might have, maybe it helped you a little bit. It kind of your immune system sort of woke, woke it up and said, okay, you know, here comes the vaccines. You know, uh, when we go to Africa, people get, they get vaccinated like for three weeks. You know, if they haven't had these things, you know, they get rabies and they get their tetanus and they get, the, if they, they're older, they get polio. If they get, they get typhoid, they get, you know, some of them used to use yellow fever. So, and you know, in the army, they would give everybody all their vaccines all at once. Um, that, you know, you're more likely to have a, maybe have a side effect just in terms of feeling kind of bad. But if that didn't happen, I wouldn't worry about it. You know, one thing we are gonna do, I think, and as, uh, I don't know if Wally knows this, I, I propose that maybe we do antibody testing in our people that we vaccinated in about maybe two months, just to see if people develop antibodies. Bodies. And that might be one thing you could do if you were worried about whether you developed immunity. We do that for hepatitis uh, B for people. You know, the people don't respond, not everybody responds to the hepatitis B vaccine. So uh, sometimes we do that to see if, or rabies even, if you still have antibodies. If you're really worried about it, I wouldn't worry about it. The reason for doing that is just not to muddy the waters too much when, because we don't know, you know, this is a brand new vaccine and we don't know exactly what could happen. If you got a bunch of stuff just before it, maybe there would be a, a stronger reaction. Uh, the, the FDA is still keeping track of those reactions, um, uh, so uh, so they that data is still continuing to be accrued. And again, if you are doing things that might interfere with that somehow, then that may be something that, that would make it a little bit less clear what's going on with the vaccines themselves. But I wouldn't worry about it. And then there was a question from the chat, and I just wanted to comment on it. So I am a pediatric endocrinologist. I have a thousand children with type 1 diabetes. And we noticed that um, somehow they didn't get as uh, many COVID infections as we expected. Mm -hmm. uh, and then my friend, Juliet Emma Molly, is, she's a transplant surgeon, and she said that the tra transplant patients seem to be um, a bit protected against COVID because of the immune suppression they take. 
Um, so I, I, I think it's interesting that uh, populations that we thought would have been at more risk end up being at less risk. Yeah, that kind of is the, is the HIV situation and, and also people that have had other infectious diseases. It, it, I, I think it really all comes back to the immune system um, and, uh, uh, and how that plays into people, how people respond to this. But um, so it is, it's a, I think we're going to know a lot more about this disease in another year, but we need to get out of it first. It would be perfectly fine to study this retrospectively. We don't need to have a lot of new cases right. coming down our way. So. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bett. Nasser, did that answer your question or did you want to ask uh, Dr. Schreiner? Yeah, uh, thank you, Doctor, for your time. Uh, my question is, can you mix one Pfizer, one Moderna? You know, there, some people have talked about that and I, I, I think both, they, we don't recommend it, but I have heard that if, if, you know, I think it's bound to happen. It's just mm -hmm. human error. Somebody's going to, I have to say, well, I, I made sure I looked at the syringe before I got my shot yesterday that was, okay. that was a vaccine. Um, but there has been some thought that maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe you can just make it, but they're not, you're not supposed to do that. So just for, to expedite things, for example, if you know, your, your second dose is due and there's none of the one you already took. So I'm sure it will happen and that'll be proof of the pudding. An effective vaccine has been welcomed by many people. It has also led to questions. People are wondering about the vaccination process, especially sorry. with multiple manufacturers. Sorry, sorry. Somebody else talking about vaccines. <laughs> Nasser, did you have a question for Dr. Schreiner? Uh, no, I, I think uh, between Iba and Dr. Schreiner, I, I, I think I understood that if you are taking uh, medication that suppresses the immune system uh, after an organ transplant, then, uh, well, I guess, no, that didn't answer my question. Should you take the vaccine or not? That's my question. Again, that's sort of... It's a little bit of unknown territory, but I would say the answer to that is probably yes, because COVID could be bad. I, I have had a couple, I'll tell you the patient population that we've had a really hard, tough time with, uh, well, diabetics for sure, and which is, you know, it's a very common disease, uh, but also people with diabetes and renal failure. That's, that group is, it's scary. Um, I have several patients that have had renal transplants that did fine, um, but uh, I do think that, that again, it's this sort of risk benefit ratio and it does appear that it's probably better to get vaccinated and keep you from getting COVID than any problem with the vaccine itself. So it is okay if you have had an organ transplant and your immune system is suppressed for you to take the vaccine? We think so. I wish I could say a definitive yes, we don't know for sure, but we do know that um, that the disease itself is a pretty big risk for people like you, for people, I don't know if it's you, but for people that have had an organ transplant. Um, that, um, so, uh, you know, now you can make an argument, that's why we try to achieve herd immunity. So we may have a whole group of people who can't get the vaccine for some reason. And so that by getting everybody else vaccinated, it protects them. So that would be a decision that I think that person would have to discuss with their, their immunologist or their uh, transplant surgeon. Well, that's what the surgeons maybe not so much they don't know anything about coronavirus. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I know. I, I think uh, I bet we'll, we'll probably talk to Juliet and ask her then. Yeah, yeah. But I would talk to the talk to the onco oncologist or nephrologist or whoever, whatever kind of organ has been transplanted. So, um, and that's you know, there's lots of people that are in those situations. They have lupus. They're on you know prednisone, or they have rheumatoid arthritis, or they have psoriatic arthritis, or psoriasis, or colitis. You know, the use of all these immune modulating drugs that we use now for different diseases, that's going to be an issue, I think, for, for patients getting the COVID vaccine. But we think right now that it appears to be safe. There's just not a lot of information on it. Thank you so much. Tarek Trod, you had a question? And then Sundas. Uh, I do, thank you. Um, it, it's interesting you bring up uh, HIV because uh, while there's no cure, the treatment has more or less been pretty good. And it's just, it's the opposite uh, for COVID here, uh, what are the what are the prospects for uh, treatment for COVID? That's been my big disappointment because um, as an HIV provider, I mean it, it is miraculous. You know, I, I started my career at the beginning of the HIV pandemic, and you know my patients were taking forty five pills a day, and they were miserable, and they all died. I mean that's a hundred percent lethal virus, and so to to, to have made this journey where we now basically can give them one pill once a day and they're fine and they you bring them back you can bring them literally back from the brink of death 
and they're, they gain weight and they go back to work and they're completely normal. That's a huge achievement. Um, uh, the problem with COVID is that there aren't any good antivirals. I had a meeting with Gilead Pharmaceuticals, which is the company that makes most of the HIV meds, a very, a very you know, productive and, and fair-minded, I think, pharmaceutical company. And they make remdesivir, which is the only antiviral we have for COVID. And that's not a game changer. It just kind of maybe makes their time in the hospital a little less. Um, they don't have anything in the pipeline. I think everybody figures the vaccine's going to get us out of this. And so there's no far, you know, there's really no economic reason to invest in looking for new antivirals. I still think there is because this isn't going to be the last rodeo of pandemics. And what we've learned with HIV, both immunologically and, and pharmacologically, is a tribute to all the 30 million people who've died from AIDS, AIDS over the years. But I think that kind of technology can be used for viral diseases and should be used for this. I've been disappointed that there really hasn't been any kind of therapies that are very effective. The monoclonal antibody therapies, you know, Regeneron and Vanilibumib, which is the Lilly drug, are helpful in early disease maybe, um, but they really aren't game changers either. Convalescent plasma is not a game changer. It doesn't hurt people, but it really doesn't help that much. Once you start going down the really slippery slope of COVID, it's, it's hard to get people back. And um, it's, um, that's where we really need to have better therapies. But there may not be any need to it if, we get, if the thing disappears. I mean, that could happen, so. Thank you. Is Trump lucky? <laughs> well, some, of, some people, including myself, wonder whether he really had the disease or not, if, or if that was a Mark Burnett production. Because <laughs> so, um, he certainly has a lot of morbidities that would have, he shouldn't have had to go frisky afterwards, but he's also just really mean, I think. So mean people tend to, <laughs> Dr. Shindy can tell you, if you're a nice person, that's a bad prognosis. <laughs> so, that's right. That's right. Um, I don't know. I mean, he got Regeneron. He got it pretty early. He, he has a lot of blood on his hands, in my view, not just from what happened yesterday, but, you know, this, this pandemic should never have played out this way in this country. It's really a disgrace. And um, I think that it's, uh, to make masks political and not protect people is so idiotic. It, it just was really shameful. So I, oof, I think it's important for him to go on to other places. I can think of a nice place for him to go where they wear orange suits, but I don't know whether that's going to happen or not. <laughs> so. Dr. Lena, you had a question for Dr. Schreiner? Well, I was just wondering, Dr. Schreiner, if you wanted to comment on vitamin D deficiency and severity of COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so vitamin D is this kind of funny thing. Um, uh, we do use it as you know, our treatment, whether it does anything, who knows. Um, you know, the, vitamin D does have antiviral activity, uh, as, as does, you know, God forbid, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, but it's all about, um, you know, whether those are really virucidal, whether taking vitamin D helps protect you. I will, full, full disclosure, I do take vitamin D, but I also had, had sort of some low vitamin D level before COVID came along, so I don't want to fall and break my hip. But, um, you know, it's, it's vitamins play a role in infectious diseases. We know that vitamin A it can be very helpful for people with nutritional deficiencies in Africa and help decrease their risk of acquiring HIV. So they, they play a role, but they aren't the end game. And again, going back to therapies, you know, if we didn't have a good vaccine or if God forbid some, something goes wrong with these vaccines, which I don't think will happen, but if it does, then we're back to square one. That's when we have to develop medications that can get us out of it. Because I think the model of HIV is a good one on, on controlling a pandemic with therapy, not just the individual, but controlling the pandemic itself um, through treating the virus so that people don't, can't spread it to one another. So, uh, but vitamins, they're not gonna hurt you. Are they gonna help? Maybe a little bit. It's probably better not to be vitamin D deficient if you can avoid it, but it's not gonna be totally protective, so. Thank you. Uh, Sundos, go ahead, please. Yes. I have a question regarding the disease itself, not the vaccine. So do we know like what determines the severity of the symptoms in people? Because you hear about all of these young people who die and you might see a 70 year old person who doesn't die. So do we know like what determines the course of the disease? Well, that's why we call it the practice of medicine and not the science of medicine. 
because there's so much we don't know. <laughs> um, I think, and I'm sure Dr. Shindy can speak to this, the more you're, the longer you're a doctor, the more you know what you don't know. Uh, it's, you know, when you're an intern and a resident, you think you know everything and that's a great feeling. And then you, as you move through your career, you realize, I didn't know anything back in those days. And it's a miracle they didn't kill people. So, um, I, you know, we just don't really know. Um, there are some things maybe about the dose of virus that you get. Uh, so the amount of virus that you get may dictate whether you're going to have a really bad time of it. We certainly know that comorbidities, um, you know, diabetes, heart disease, pulmonary disease uh, are high risk factors, diabetes in particular. And diabetes is a disease that isn't understood very well. I mean, when you think about it, we should be much farther along in treating that disease and we're not. We should be able to cure that disease and we can't. So it's a very, very common disease throughout the world now. So. So there's just a lot of factors that contribute to good outcomes and bad outcomes. And, and some of it is sort of predictable. Um, some of it is not predictable. The, pre the time of presentation, um, you know, again, your gender, that may have something to do with it. There may be some genetic things. We certainly know with HIV that that turned out to be an important observation uh, with HIV that people of Northern European um, uh, descent did not get HIV as much as people that weren't from Northern Europe, you know, people that are, were exposed, Elton John's a good example. He was exposed to lots of HIV, he never got it. And it turns out that the binding site for HIV is the same one that binds the uh, plague bacillus. And so when the plague raged through Europe, it kind of took out everybody who expressed the CCR5 binding site and selectively um, saved those people who didn't. So there, there may be something about this virus that has a genetic component. You know, why does it affect the poor so much? Because they live in large households. And they just constantly are exposed to a lot of virus. And, and poverty is a stressor. And your immune system is impaired when you're you know, in that situation. So there's a lot of, you know, our, our understanding of the immune system and, and infectious diseases is still, you know, we just have just barely scratched the surface. And uh, so those are going to be important questions going forward. And, and, you know, the whole sociological part of this pandemic, you know, when you see, when pandemics happen, a lot of social unrest happens. That's common, regardless of whether the government is efficient or not. But it stirs up a lot of the inequities in society. And, um, and you know, it, it shouldn't be a, a privilege to have access to health care. It, it needs to be a right. And I think that that's, that really makes the society in general healthier when you address the inequities of, of health care distribution and so forth and, and disease. So, Maybe we've learned a little something with this. I don't know. It's always it's sort of two steps forward and one step back. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schender. Uh I think Mrs. Khan has another question. You're muted. You're muted. Yeah. So that's become the, the phrase of this year: is you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> I have that question, and then my other question is: why do cats or why are they attracted to Zoom? My cat's locked in the yep. other room because he always comes in and interferes with my lectures. Our cat came up here and then left. So, so she, she came by and then left. <laughs> They're always attracted to the Zoom thing. Yes. Mrs. Khan, go ahead, please. Yeah. Thank you for taking one more question from me. Sure. Uh, actually, uh, one is um, there's so many stories about how, what is the most common way of uh, spreading this. And I know that schools are open, but, uh, and, and um, bars were open for some time and so on. And then, but then families is the one that they have the most, they keep, tell you to stay away. So I just want to know if there is any uh, information since the last nine months, if you have, if you have first-hand noticed that there, yes, it is through family members. And second, second question would be my husband being a physician and he's vaccinated now, but if he's a carrier, should he be wearing a mask around me? Yes. Uh, you know, compromised. So. Okay. Well, uh, I don't want to get involved in any kind of <laughs> perpetrator of difficulties between, <laughs> between husband and wife. So I'm even steer clear of that question. <laughs> um, you know, I think we're, we're concerned. For example, I, uh, my, I have an 89-year-old, very vital mother, but she's not been vaccinated yet. She's just itching to get vaccinated. So. Um, uh, but I'm very, very careful around her because I go down to, you know, COVID land there every day and it's possible that I could be carrying it back even though I've been vaccinated. We hope that the vaccines help decrease the spread. Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm kind of, and I, I'm, I'm an optimistic person. I think I try to see the glass half full all the time, but I do think we're seeing the beginning of the end. It's, it's 
or at least at least the end of the beginning, but I think it is the beginning of the end. I, I don't think it's the end. And I think we're going to be dealing with this for many more months, if not years. But if people can kind of just hang in there to get through this surge, certainly those of us who live in LA County, and get over this hump um, and get vaccinated, then once you get vaccinated, then you'll both be protected quite well. And once we get rid of all this disease that's floating around, then then we really can resume a normal life. I love to go to restaurants. I like to eat out. I certainly love to travel. Um, and that's been, I don't care so much about the restaurants, but the traveling part's been the hardest thing for me. And I'm, I'm just sick of going to the hospital in my house and the hospital in my house. And the, it's just, it's, you know, I mean, I, I'm energized when I'm at the hospital with my colleagues and I love coming home to my house and my animals, but I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm done with it. Plus I, I haven't had a housekeeper in 10 months. So it's, I realized that she actually went after a lot more cobwebs than I do. So, <laughs> yes. so yeah, so I, I don't think, I, I don't think he necessarily should, has to wear masks, but I mean, it would be, if you're exposed to a lot of COVID right now in the hospital uh, or in the outpatient setting, it's probably prudent to be a little bit careful with that whole thing. Especially because of uh, immunosuppressed, I mean, su su suppressed immune system, we have two members in the family. That's why I just wanted to know. Yeah, I, yeah, I would be a little careful with that. Secondly, um, seeing your family members, that is still a no-no? So it, it's, it, the problem is, is every person that you have contact with, they've had contact with other people. And, you know, all of these transmission events, which really are mostly in families, and it's not that going to the bar is a better thing than going to your family, but um, the problem is, is that you don't, you're, you let your, your guard down. It's your family. And you just, oh, that's, that's my mom, or that's my brother, or that's my husband, or that's my daughter. And, but they can carry the virus. And uh, younger people in particular can be symptom, not symptomatic and, and spread the virus. And so we know that most transmission occurs in the home. It also occurs to a certain degree in workplaces. It certainly does occur at bars. It certainly occurs at super spreader events, concerts, rallies, you know, Supreme Court indoctrinations. That was definitely a big super spreader. Um, so, you know, whenever you have lots of people together, unmasked, talking, singing, God forbid singing is a really terrible thing to do with COVID. The last, the last concert I went to uh, was at the Disney Concert Hall. It was the Chieftains, which I, I love Irish music. And I was sitting in, I don't know if you've been to the Disney Concert Hall, but when you sit behind the orchestra, I was right behind 25 bagpipers. And I did a whole session of one of my classes on instruments and COVID. And it turns out the bagpipes are really effective way of spreading COVID. Thank God none of those guys had COVID, I guess, at that time. But I'm sure some people in that audience did. And whenever you have large groups of people together, it's just so infectious. It just wants to go to somebody else who doesn't have immunity. And that's why families are dangerous. Families are dangerous for other reasons, but, um, but, <laughs> but there it's, it's the, it's the fact that you don't, think about it that much when it's somebody you know really well. And that's why it happens at home. All right. So it's been two hours since we started, over two hours, and it flew by. Um, I think this is the longest session we've had with the most interest. No one really dropped off. So Dr. Schreiner, I thank you for um, your very entertaining and informative discussion. I think it is a uh, a discussion. I did record it. I hope you didn't mind. I recorded part of it towards the end. One of my oh, you might have friends. to edit out the Trump stuff, though. While oh, we'll leave that in. That's okay. Don't worry. You're you're okay. Don't worry. We'll we'll back you up. We we got you, Kim. Don't worry. We so. have a new administration. But uh, you just to just to let you know, Muslim Family Night's been around for several years in Pasadena, and you are the first non-Muslim to be on Muslim Family Night. And I think I made probably the best choice ever. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Uh, we appreciate all the hard work you do for Pasadena and the community of Pasadena. Um, and, uh, you know, we are here to support you. Let us know what we can do. Uh, and from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much from our community. I appreciate it. Very much. It's very much my pleasure. And uh, uh, I know that all of you who know Dr. Shindy, he is a, just a superb physician. Oh, His you. patients love him. Uh, he is so kind and compassionate and such a good listener. He's a wonderful teacher. Our house staff have learned so much from him. And I'm very pri privileged to have him as a friend. So uh, thank you very much for giving me. This was a blast. I had a good time. So good. Thank you, thank you, so, much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Come, come back and be part of the family, Dr. Schreiner. I will. Uh, I love yes, you. You're always welcome. You're always welcome, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Back. On a better note with some good food next time. We do this in person in Pasadena. 
and we will invite you to have come food with us and come give us another talk at, at a better time when we're all vaccinated and together. So that'll inshallah. be the plan, God willing. Inshallah. Thank you. Inshallah. Hope it's Thank soon. You. Very soon, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. So, Bye. Just real quick, we have another talk, inshallah, in two weeks. Uh, Sister Summer Abdul Aziz will talk to us on the mindset potential. So it'll be two weeks from today, inshallah. Um, a very interesting discussion. Um, so we will topic again? Mindset potential. Your mindset potential. So a very Thank kind of uplifting, positive you. thing by Summer of the Aziz. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. of you know her. So that'll be in two weeks from today, inshallah. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Everyone be okay. safe. Be healthy. Thank you. Cover your, cover, cover your noises. Thank you. Stay away from family. Sure. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Have a good evening. Enjoy your weekend. Thank Good night, you. Bye now. Bye. Assalamu alaikum. I saw the noise earlier. Bye, I'm sorry. Bye, <laughs> bye, bye. Bye, bye. <laughs> Salam, everyone. Bye, bye Dan. Hello. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Love you guys. You like that, Nana? Yeah, we do. Salam, Dr. Walid. Thank you, Dr. Walid. Dr. Walid, you forgot to say that you're also handsome. Oh. <laughs> oh. Doctor. Oh. We want to start any rumors, Nana. Hey, 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 she, she is both I, I don't, I don't mean to miss you. <laughs> ah, you know. She is not to tell you that next to her husband. I know. <laughs> it's okay. You like my son. No problem. <laughs> No, 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 no. Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. I know him since he was a little kid. No problem for that. Honestly, that was really, that was wonderful. wonderful. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. She's, very, Alhamdulillah. she's a very nice lady. She's, she, uh, she never says no. She's always very helpful. I can text her and call her. So she's a wonderful person. Alhamdulillah. Uh, Alhamdulillah. So. She's amazing. She's amazing. She's amazing. She's amazing. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Very nice. Good job, Oli. Thank you. Thank you.